As many of you know, the past year I've been gradually working my way through every major brand of acrylic gouache on the market. So far, I have tested and reviewed three major brands of acrylic gouache. And so, after all that, did you really think I wouldn't try the fourth big name in the acrylic gouache scene? Today's video is dedicated to Turner's Acryl Gouache. Like Acryla, this particular gouache is manufactured in Japan. I ended up buying the 12 color set from Jerry's Artorama through Amazon. I bought this back in April and it was $28, but I noticed it was way cheaper for back to school and Labor Day at $21.99. So if you're looking for deals on art supplies, August and September seems to be a good time. Either way, my first impression at $28 was that it was really cheap, and $22 would have been an absolute steal. Each tube in this set is 20 milliliters or around 0.68 ounces, which is a pretty typical size for gouache. When you open the box, it has a page of information and instructions, but unfortunately, I don't speak Japanese. Based on the graphics, though, I can make some inferences. I assume this is the maximum recommended dilution ratio, and this likely refers to dry time or open working time. And here it shows the surfaces you can use this on. The color names and pigment names on the tube luckily are in English. And that's really all I need anyway. I'm just going to use this like I would any other acrylic gouache. I was working on some other things at the end of April when I bought these, so I set the paints aside and sort of forgot about them for about three months. So by the time I got back to these, it was the beginning of August, and the paints were much cheaper. Anyway, the first thing I recommend when trying out new art supplies is to make samples or swatches. Swatches are a good low pressure way to get a feel for a new paint, and the card is also great for future reference if you want to match colors or whatever. Just for fun and because I'm really eager for fall, I decided to make my swatches in pumpkin shapes. The first thing I notice is that the colors all seem to be unusually bright and vibrant. And because I'm of a suspicious nature, that made me wonder about the light fastness of the paint. The first six colors have the word permanent in the paint name, which to me implies that they all have at least acceptable light fastness. Since I can't read the label, I looked up the ratings online. Turner lists the ratings on their website using a three-star system, with three being most light fast, I assume. And I also looked up the ASTM ratings on Jerry's website. Most dedicated art retailers will post this information in the item description, so it wasn't a big deal to look it up. The first color in the set is Permanent Red. The pigment name is PR170, which tells me that this is a naphthol red. The ASTM rating is 2, which means very good light fastness, and Turner has it down as 2 stars. I thought it was a really beautiful classic red. The next color I looked at was Permanent Scarlet, using the pigment PR9, which you may also know as Naphthol Scarlet. It's really bright and pretty. The ASTM light fastness rating on this color is 2, and Turner gives it a permanency rating of 2 stars. Next, I took a look at this permanent yellow deep. This color is actually a mixture of two pigments, PY55 and PY170. My research tells me that these are both dairy light pigments. The ASTM light fastness rating on this color is 2, or very good, and Turner gave it a permanency rating of two stars. The next color in this collection is Permanent Lemon. The pigment in this one is PY3, which is Hansa Yellow. The ASTM rating for this color is one, or excellent. On Turner's light fastness scale, this got three stars. 
The next color I looked at was Permanent Green Light. This paint is another mixture. This time it's a mix between the pigments PG7 and PY3. So that makes it a mix between Thalo Green and Hansa Yellow. According to Jerry's website, this paint has a ASTM rating of excellent, or one, and Turner gives it a rating of three stars. The next color is Permanent Green Middle. This color is also a mixture between two pigments. This time the pigments are PB15 and PY3. So Thalo Blue, and again the same Hansa Yellow. So just like before, the rating on this one is one, or excellent, and Turner gives it three stars. The next color in the set is this really pretty kind of cyan blue called sky blue. This particular paint contains three pigments, PB15, PY3, and PW6. So that would be phthalo blue, the same Hansa yellow again, and titanium white. The ASTM permanency rating is one, and Turner likewise gives it three stars. The next color in the set is cobalt blue hue. Now you can tell by the word hue that this is not genuine cobalt. As far as I can tell, this line doesn't use any heavy metals, so that excludes cobalt. The actual pigment content is PB29 and PW6. So it's actually just ultramarine blue and titanium white. So the ASTM light fastness rating on this particular paint is two or very good. And on Turner's scale, it gets two stars. This next color is violet and it's pretty interesting. It's very bright and it's also labeled fluorescent, which automatically screams fugitive to me. But the pigment listed is PV23, which is just dioxazine purple. In terms of light fastness, dioxazine purple is usually a two or very good. But if you compare this to a straight dioxazine purple, it's obviously a lot brighter due to the fluorescent component. So I don't even know what to think. When I looked up the ratings, the paint was listed as not rated by both Jerry's and Turner, likely due to the fluorescent component. And I found this sheet on Jerry's website, and it specifically lists violet as one of the colors that is not light fast enough. So that is likely the reason why this color is not rated. I think we'll probably do some home light fastness testing on this myself, just to satisfy my curiosity and on some of the other colors in the line, but it will be several months before I know anything. So the best assumption you can make when you see the word fluorescent is to assume that the paint is probably not light fast. White was the next color in the set, so obviously this is PW6 or titanium white, like most whites in production today. So there wasn't really any big surprise on this one, so for this one, I decided to draw a face on my pumpkin to look at the opacity. I'm going to be testing the opacity of all the colors in a little bit, but so far it looks pretty good. The next color that I looked at is Burnt Sienna. And this particular Burnt Sienna is a mix of PR101, which is red oxide, and PBR11, which is iron oxide. So obviously the light fastness of Burnt Sienna is typically excellent. I think it's kind of funny that of the four different tubes of Burnt Sienna I sampled across the different brands, the pigment content of each one has been completely unique. And I found that to be true of other colors as well. Each different brand has a slightly different blend of pigments. And where the pigment content differs, it's difficult to make apples to apples comparisons. So far in my testing, the only thing that is ever truly the same is white. It's always PW6 or titanium dioxide. The last color I sampled was jet black using PBK1. Again, the light fastness is excellent. I thought it was a really nice, deep, rich black, and it was also very matte. 
After I sampled each color, I then tested the tinting strength of the colors at 50% white. And I also mixed some shades with 50% black. The tints came out really bright and pretty, and I thought the shades were really rich and beautiful. So I was impressed. After that, I was ready to test the opacity, and again, I doodled some silly faces on my pumpkins with black sharpie. Generally, I thought the opacity was not bad and pretty typical of gouache. On this test, I would say the worst colors were Permanent Scarlet, Permanent Lemon, and Sky Blue. All of the swatches appeared uniformly matte, as expected. But just to be sure, and to help you see this more easily on camera, I also made these larger cards. And it only confirmed what I saw in the smaller swatches. These are flawlessly matte. The brush strokes are invisible, the colors are opaque and vibrant. Just look at these four swatch cards for black. There is just no contest. I was actually really shocked when I put these all together. The Turner black is like velvet. You can see it here with an actual velvet ribbon. It has so much more depth and richness than the other blacks. I honestly was not expecting it to be this good. And at this point I'm thinking there's got to be a catch, right? I still don't know what it is, but the swatches clearly speak for themselves. Now that we've seen the swatches, I think we are more than ready to see them in action. So I made a series of brief sketches or studies in my sketchbook. The first painting I was feeling really indecisive and I didn't know what to paint. I laid out all my colors on my palette as I kind of stalled. And then when I had a full palette laid out, I finally decided to paint a picture of a couple of ducks that I had on my phone. I took the reference for this back in the spring, and these are mallard ducks that I'm going to be painting, and it's a male and a female. The female was on the water, and the male was kind of standing guard on a rock nearby. I think they may have laid eggs close by, and the male was just kind of watching me and her really closely. The ducks in this area are still pretty wary of humans. So I just sat really quietly and watched them for quite a while. I didn't want to scare them off. Anyway, I thought the pair of them were just really sweet and I thought it would be cute to paint them together. I liked how this sketch turned out and I also decided pretty quickly that I really loved the feeling of the paints. It's a quality that is a little hard to show you on camera, and I think it might be subjective to a degree, but I thought that they glided nicely, if that makes sense. They reminded me a lot of the way that Acrylla feels. They just felt very natural and flowy. Some paints kind of feel that they are dragging too much or they feel a bit gritty. I always add water to my paints anyway, and of course that always counters that feeling of drag on the brush. But I could tell right away that I really liked the feel of the paint, and it really made a good first impression on me. A few days later, I returned back to my sketchbook for another round. I was really looking forward to painting with these again. I mentioned that I've really been looking forward to fall, and by the time you see this, it will hopefully be September. So I thought I'd like to paint some seasonal things. And if by chance you are watching at some other time in the future, hopefully you'll enjoy this little piece of autumn anyway. Where I'm at, it's still disgustingly hot, so I really enjoyed the diversion. Anyway, the painting itself is of a decorative pumpkin. These things are all over craft stores and places like Target, and I think they are so cute. I currently have real pumpkins growing outside, and I'm so excited for those. They are getting so big. 
but I also have a few of these artificial pumpkins too. And I guess it's kind of a silly thing to paint, but once I had the idea to paint it, it wouldn't let me go. The colors are all very muted and natural and subtle in this, but what I was really interested in was all the texture, and I began to get very excited to find out if I could convey that texture in paint. I kept the palettes pretty simple, so mostly just earthy colors, yellows and browns, but I did throw in the violet color. I really like to mix colors using their complements. It's my favorite way to take the edge off of a color that is a little bit too strong. Once I got going on this, everything went really smoothly. Start to finish, I think it took me around 40 minutes or so, and for me, that's a pretty quick painting. Anyway, soon I was daydreaming of pumpkins in fall and all things cozy, and I didn't want to paint anything else. I sat down later in the evening, off camera, and started sketching a candy apple from Imagination. After I painted the apple part itself, I tried painting a plastic wrapper around it, and I thought it might have ruined it. So I decided to try again on camera, this time without a wrapper. I think the original apple actually looked better than the second one, at least before I put the plastic wrap on, but I still think it turned out fine anyway. I always see things more clearly when I review the footage, and that's really when I notice mistakes or I recognize when I should have stopped. It's really a great learning exercise. The part of the painting that looked odd to me was the puddle of candy at the bottom of the apple. And as I was watching the video, I realized that the puddle was maybe just a little too round and perfect looking. That being said, I thought it looked pretty good, especially since I was working off of imagination or memory. Okay, so here's the thing. I do not particularly like red candy apples. That probably makes me seem really weird since I just painted this twice. I do think that they are really pretty and I love the way the red candy looks against the green of the apple. It's one of those things where I get more enjoyment from actually looking at it than eating it. I do however like caramel and chocolate covered apples and suddenly a monster was born and I had to paint a caramel covered apple. You know, just in case you guys didn't think I was crazy enough. The painting went really quickly, especially since I had already painted two apples previously. The only thing that was really different was the candy coating. I also decided to paint a more irregular puddle beneath the apple, which I thought was an improvement over the previous painting I think it just made it look a little more interesting. When I was done, I thought it looked pretty delicious, if I do say so myself, and I kind of want to eat it, but it's paint. <laughs> I don't think I've eaten one of these in like 10 years, and I just looked them up online, and they're going for nearly $10 an apple these days at the candy store. I thought that was a bit much for a single apple on a stick, so I think I'll stick to painted apples. Or maybe homemade. Hmm. Anyway, the insatiable monster in me wanted to paint ever more varieties and flavors of candy apples, but I wisely decided it was probably time to move on with the review. And okay, it may have also been the last page in my sketchbook and I didn't have room. And I haven't quite ordered a new one yet. And yes, the first page will probably be a chocolate drizzled apple, perhaps with peanut butter cups. It's probably pretty obvious at this point that I really enjoyed working with this paint. 
The colors are vibrant. It was one of the first things that caught my attention about these paints, in fact. The range is large, with over 200 colors. That's a wider assortment of colors than all the other brands I have tested. But you won't find pigments containing heavy metals like cobalt or cadmium in that selection. Also, this paint is a little less accessible than the other brands. In the US, it's sold exclusively through Jerry's Artorama. And if you live elsewhere in the world, you can find a list of retailers on their website based on your location. The finish is beautiful matte and velvety, and it really is the classic gouache look. The opacity is good in some colors and not as good in others. Since I've done a lot of these videos, I can tell you that this is pretty typical of gouache. You'll get full coverage in two coats or if you add white or black. But let's be honest, most of us are probably not trying to cover pumpkin faces drawn in Sharpie anyway. So for most cases, the opacity is really good. There are always a few people who wonder about smell, and I would say that in the quantities of paint that I use, there's no noticeable odor. And nothing that is atypical of acrylic paints in general. Something that is important to note about all brands of acrylic gouache, not just this brand, is that the paint surface is a little more sensitive or delicate than typical acrylics. I wanted to bring a little awareness to this issue because it took me a while to figure this out, and I don't think it's widely known or discussed. I only discovered by accident because I store my swatch cards in a drawer, and I noticed that some of the older cards appeared a little bit scuffed. I don't use the drawer that frequently, so I was a little surprised by the wear. But if you think about it, it makes sense. In acrylic paints, the acrylic polymer binder has a protective effect, but the problem of course is that like other plastics, it's quite shiny. In order to achieve the classic matte finish that is the hallmark of acrylic gouache, paint manufacturers have to reduce the amount of binder in the paint relative to the pigment load. This makes the paint less shiny, but the consequence is less binder to protect the pigment. Incidentally, this is also why most acrylic paints have a maximum recommended dilution ratio. The more that the binder and the pigment is spread out, the weaker the paint film will be. So it's just something to keep in mind if you are new to acrylic gouache and interested in the archival side of things. I haven't noticed the problem with the paintings in my sketchbook. It's just the cards, and my cards do get handled a little more frequently than I think most paintings would be. The final thing I looked at was the price. I calculated the price per unit in milliliters of each of the four brands based on the color titanium white, which is pretty consistent across the brands and I looked at all the different sizes available. And I'll quickly throw some of that up on the screen here. Obviously, Turner was way cheaper than Acrylla, and the other three brands were pretty comparable. Keep in mind, these prices are just a snapshot in time at one retailer and don't necessarily reflect the price you'll pay but it should give you a general idea. You usually get a bit of a break on the unit price when you purchase a set. And my average unit price that I paid for this set was about 12 cents a milliliter. And if you manage to score the $21.99 sale, the unit price drops to 9 cents a milliliter. So overall, I'd say this paint is a really good deal. My bottom line is that I like the paint, and I would definitely buy this again. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up. And if you haven't seen any of my previous squash reviews, be sure to check out this playlist. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please leave them below. I love to hear from you guys.
Thank you so much for watching. Bye.